Hi, so in this video we'll be looking at the intermediate goods sector of the Roma research and development model. In the previous video we looked at the final goods sector and the one before that we introduced the model, so check out those if you haven't already. But in this video we'll be looking at the intermediate goods sector. So what do we mean by the intermediate goods sector? Well, we have a number of firms which have got monopoly power over some capital good, which we'll call XI. We have lots of these intermediate goods or these capital goods, XIs, which can be sold by the monopolists in the intermediate goods sector at price PI. So they have monopoly power because these firms have a patent on the good. So they buy a patent in the intermediate goods sector and they buy this patent from the research and development sector, which we will cover in the next video. And as I say, we're just going to make these choices conditional on whatever happens in the other sectors. So we derived in the previous video what happens in the final goods sector. And so we now know that, but this intermediate goods sector is going to take as given um, the what's coming out of the R&D sector. So consequently we're just going to maximize our do our maximization problems and it's going to work out that that all comes out quite nicely and works together with the other sectors of the economy so these intermediate goods firms have a patent over each xi which they can sell at pi but they don't necessarily have lots of xi they still need to produce their intermediate goods to then be able to sell them at pi so what they can do is they can rent a unit of capital at the rental rate of capital, which we assume is R, which is the same for every good in the industry or for every firm in the industry, just the rental rate R is the rental rate of capital. And they can use this R or this rented unit of capital to produce their intermediate good XI. Or instead of drawing it in this way, it would make more sense me to say that this rented capital allows them to produce XI which you, they can then sell on to the final goods sector and we are going to have some sort of profit in this model because these firms have patents so they have monopoly power and we will show all of that as we derive the profit function right now so Intermediate goods firms, they're going to be maximizing their profits just as we had in the final goods sector, but we have their output as a function of the amount of their intermediate good they're choosing. So they, they only they have uh, this patent over an inter intermediate good, XI, and they are only choosing the quantity of this that they want to produce and then that they want to sell. So they can sell this for some price, which is a function of the output they produce, and we multiply that by the output they produce, and we have their costs, which are the rental rate of capital, which they need to rent in order to produce the good, multiplied by the quantity they produce again. And then we can take a first order condition of this profit function in order to maximize the profits in the intermediate goods sector, and since we only have the choice variables of the actual intermediate good input, we can just take the first order condition with respect to this. And for each firm in the intermediate good sector, it would be with respect to potentially a different uh, XI. So for one firm, it would be X1 and for the other one, X2 and so on. So if we differentiate this profit function we're going to have to use the product rule on this first term and so we should know what the product rule says but this this will give us an a derivative looking like this and then we take a the derivative of this second term we just get minus r out so that's our first order condition we set that equal to zero what we can now do is use the fact that the price level as we found in the previous video from the final goods sector is equal to this expression alpha ly so that's the labor used in the final goods sector to the power of one minus alpha multiplied by the quantity of the intermediate good used to the power of alpha minus one and we can substitute that in for 
uh, the price in this first order condition because what we need to be the case is that this this condition holds because these two sectors are trading with each other or the the intermediate goods sector is selling to the final goods sector and the final goods sector is buying the same product so these prices have to be the same because they are they are just trading at these prices and in the previous video we just had this maybe equal to pi and we've we just said that now it depends on xi because as we we know with demand curves the quantity demanded tends to depend on the price and the price tends to depend on the quantity that's being demanded and so on so we can substitute this into our first order condition obviously we have to take the derivative of this with respect to x1 in order to substitute it into this this derivative term but okay if we take the if we substitute that in we get this line of working and that, that should be fairly clear and what we can notice is that we can actually factorize out this alpha ly 1 to the power of 1 minus alpha xi to the power of alpha minus 1 and the reason that this is present in both of these terms is simply because we have taken the derivative of this term but then we've multiplied it by xi so we've taken the derivative with respect to xi so we've taken a minus 1 away or we maybe put this to the power of minus alpha minus 2 and um, but then we've just multiplied it again by xi so this has gone back to alpha to the minus 1 so we take that out as a factor what we get as remaining in brackets is 1 plus alpha minus 1 and this is all equal to r and we'll notice that these ones just cancel each other out and notice again that this, this term that we have factored out is actually whoops where is it it is exactly the same as what we defined the price to be although I've changed it slightly by putting a 2 there and uh, th this is exactly the same so this is just the price level uh, dependent on x1 so we can just say that that is equal to p x1 and then I've just divided across by this alpha so divided through by alpha so we get that the price with respect to x1 is equal to 1 over alpha multiplied by r the rental rate of capital and so what does this tell us? It tells us that the price of a of an intermediate good is just a markup of the marginal cost of producing it. So the marginal cost of production is R, the rental rate of renting capital to produce X1, but we're charging slightly more than this. We're charging more because obviously alpha is between zero and one because it's the uh, share of the intermediate goods the share that this intermediate good gets of the income in our economy so it can't be greater than 1 so this 1 over alpha multiplied by R is greater than R so our price is higher than the marginal cost and this arises because we have monopoly power in this industry so they can charge a price higher than marginal cost so we have markup pricing and this is a constant markup for every one of the intermediate goods XI so we can rearrange this by multiplying the alpha back across and we just get this expression here r is equal to alpha multiplied by the price and what we're going to do is we're going to start to think about the profit function in this economy and the profits that are actually made by the intermediate goods firms and we know that they must make profits because we've just said that their prices are higher than marginal cost so they're making some sort of profit so we can notice that yeah, r is equal to alpha times the price and we also can note that this rental rate r by assumption is going to be the same for every single firm and it's going to be the same with whichever sort of capital we're renting in order to produce whatever intermediate good we haven't subscripted this r by an i or anything so it's just the same for every firm and if r is the same for every firm and this alpha is the same for every firm it's just this constant then PIXI or PI has to be the same for every firm as well just for this for this equality to hold so we can rewrite PIXI as just being equal to P and this is the price of an intermediate good is just going to be the same for every intermediate firms output
And if the price is the same for all of these goods, and we and we have this demand function for each of the goods, PI, XI, and this is, this is the same for every good as well. So the demand for every good is going to be the same, and so XI, the quantity demanded of these, is going to be the same. So for every intermediate good, the demand is going to be exactly the same, and we can just call this X, and we don't need to subscript anymore. So we are now going to get a symmetric equilibrium in that all the prices of every firm is the same and all the demand is the same and we can start to think about uh, the aggregate profit function and we, we could then uh, divide through by the number of firms and give an individual firm's profit function but the, what we make we make these assumptions so that it simplifies when we aggregate up so the profit functions of firms are going to be quite simple it's just the price that they sell their output for but we take away the marginal cost of that output R and just multiply by the number of the good that they sell, which is X. And as I say, we don't need to subscript this with I because we've just seen that this is the same for every firm. We also had that this R is equal to alpha P as we found above, so we can just substitute that in here to expand or to sort of manipulate our profit function and then take out px as a factor of this line of working to get to this uh, line of working and then we can substitute in for this px value and as we have used it before we know that this p is equal to alpha ly to the 1 minus alpha x to the alpha minus 1 as we derived from the final good sector in the previous video so if we multiply this by our x, as we have px that we're substituting in for, well, this uh, my x to the alpha minus 1 just becomes x to the alpha. So we substitute that value in here, and we get that our profits are equal to alpha multiplied by alpha minus 1 multiplied by this labor to the power of 1 minus alpha multiplied by x to the power of alpha. And so to go a little bit further, from our profit function we can recall this result or not this result but this is what we started with our production function in the final goods sector which said this I won't explain exactly where that came from because I did in the previous video but if we use along with this the fact that our xi is now equal to x from what we've just discussed this production function can just become this y is equal to a multiplied by ly to the power 1 minus alpha multiplied by x to the alpha and we've done we can do this because what we effectively have in brackets here is just the sum from i equals 1 to a of xi and if we assume that xi is equal to x as we have done this is just going to be equal to a x to the alpha so we then get this production function which looks a lot nicer and it actually looks a lot more like a Cobb-Douglas production function and this is why we have assumed that we have A intermediate goods because we can now get this A term out which represents our technology or our TFP in a Cobb-Douglas production function and so from the above that we have this profit function here we can notice that we can substitute in our Y from this equation and we can substitute this in for our uh, ly to the 1 minus alpha multiplied by x to the alpha and divide it by a and we can get that our profits are actually equal to this term here which is a lot nicer having it in terms of y and a further to this profit function th this is a profit function that we're going to be using in the future but what we can also do is we can make an assumption if we say that our capital stock is just equal to a multiplied by x why do we make this assumption well we make this assumption because we can now from our production function which we have here we can substitute in for this x term here using this expression here so obviously x is now equal to k over a so we just substitute that in to this line of working and we notice that we have this a term here which we can multiply across and we get to this line of working and so both our a and our ly 
are raised to the power of 1 minus alpha, so we can put these in brackets together to get to this new production function, this is y is equal to this, and clearly this is the same neoclassical production function that we were using in the videos on the solar growth model balanced growth path. We have our sort of units of effective labor and they're raised to the power 1 minus alpha multiplied by k to the alpha. So it, this is a Cobb-Douglas production function with some sort of labor augmenting technology. And so since we know, since we've used this before, we can actually just use the same methods we've used in the videos to find our quantities of steady state variables, our quantities of balanced growth path variables, our actual balanced growth path, and the speed of convergence to this balanced growth path. We can use all of these things again, and that's that's very useful. And it's why we made this assumption up here that k is equal to ax. Because if we use this assumption, well, we can use the exact same processes we have done in the other models. And it doesn't matter that we've got this new model with all these different sectors. We can still find balanced growth paths in the same way, which is very nice. And we've derived that from the intermediate good sector. So that will wrap up this video on this sector in the next video we'll look at the r and d sector so make sure to check out the playlist for that make sure to subscribe for some extra economics in your subscription feed and do like this video that'll be very helpful to me if it was at all useful